welcome. We're Pac LA. I'm Bailey Mizell, the director of Pac LA. And we're here with Sally Stein and Stephen Callis uh, presenting the Vivian Meyer portfolio developed from Alan Sakula's personal collection of her work, 17 Negatives specifically. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about the Alan Sakula Social Documentary Fund at CalArts that the portfolio impacts and has helped to develop. Um, just a little note about today's presentation. We'll go ahead and they'll present for about 40 to 45 minutes. And we'll say 15, 20 minutes at the end for an open Q&A. So during the presentation, please feel free to add your questions in the chat in the Q&A box and we'll get right to that. Um, again, we're happy to have you all here today. Thank you for joining us. I'm gonna give a quick shout out to our board um, of directors for their support, ongoing support. And thank you to our members and audience for attending today. I'm gonna go ahead and pass it over to Sally and Steven now for their presentation. Uh, I'll be off screen. Again, I'll return at the end to moderate the questions for the Q&A. And again, please feel free to add your questions and uh, comments in the chat. And thank you for everyone in advance who sent your comments uh, during your registration. Wonderful comments about Alan and Sally and Stephen. Uh, we'd love to hear from you today as well at the end of the presentation. So I'm going to pass it over now to Sally and Stephen, and I'll be back at the end. Okay. Okay, do we do share, who knows? Okay. Yeah. I think so. No. Can you see this? Yeah, Sally, we just see the header here of the presentation. Shoot, sorry. It's okay. Here. Um, no? Not yet. Oh. It's loading. I Coming. Think. Not up there? There, here it there is. There you go. Oh, you got it. Yeah. Okay. Hey guys, I'm 71 going on 72 and still a newbie with Zoom, so forgive me. So um, it's great to be here and thanks very much to PAC LA and to Bailey Mizell, whom I first met at CalArts when I was subbing for Alan when he was ill back around 2012 probably, or it might be 2011, I'm not, I was there for a couple of semesters. Um, we're doing a portfolio presentation with a backstory by me and Stephen Callis, because we worked on this together on Alan Sakula's connection to Vivian Meyer, because a lot of people have asked, like, what is Alan's connection with Vivian Meyer? Was she his secret aunt, mother, what, whatever, um, grandmother? Uh, the connection of the portfolio to the making of a memorial Alan Sakula social documentary fund at the school CalArts where he taught for many decades and a few of the CalArts student projects the resulting fund facilitated. Okay, let's see if we can. <coughs> and I have spring allergies. I've already taken my medicine, but forgive me for coughing once in a while. Um, uh, probably most of you know a fair amount. Some of you may have become encyclopedically knowledgeable about Vivian Meyer since she rose to fame around 2012-13 with first radio stories about the discovery of the unknown quote nanny photographer who was born in France but lived most of her adult life in Chicago where she worked as a nanny. <coughs> There have been since uh, at least a handful of books of her work and also at least two biographies, I think even a third uh, in French. Um, and some of you presumably also know something about uh, Alan Sakula as well, my late husband, um, and probably associated him more with somebody who is sticking it to those in power, such as in his work, uh, both his work of criticism and of photography, like Dear Bill Gates from 1999. I'm having trouble seeing the screen, but uh, can you all see it or is there extra stuff overlaid with it? I can see is it. Okay. Yeah, we can okay. see it. <coughs> um, Dear Bill Gates was a piece he did uh, at the end of the last century, uh, at the time when he was spending some time in Seattle, both in terms of uh, talking about his work on globalization fish story, um, but he also was very interested in the rise of the celebrity um, info impresario, dear Bill, uh, Bill Gates. And um, when he read that Bill Gates uh, had actually bought a maritime painting, a famous maritime painting by Winslow, 
lost on the Grand Banks. Uh, he actually followed this very carefully. I mean, Alan read a bunch of newspapers every day. And um, at the time they were saying this is the highest that had ever been paid for an American painting at auction. And so he wrote a, a kind of ransom note, I mean, a mock ransom note um, uh, to accompany these three self portraits he made using a Nikonos uh, in the very cold water of the lake in front of Bill Gates's mansion. Um, uh, in which he uh, first said, I think you probably paid too much for the painting, but really why would you want a painting of two lost fishermen, uh, net fishermen? So he's playing already, Alan loved puns with both the old idea of fishing nets and now the new internet. Um, and uh, finally asking, uh, why is it that even though you have bought an entire, a huge library of images, uh, that you are selling. This painting is not part of that accessible library that one can buy reproductions of. So already speaking about the division the rich make between mine and thine, the mass thine in this case. Um, and finally asking, uh, and when you're on the net, do you feel like you're in it the way these uh, fishermen who probably are going to die at sea are in it or are you on top of it? Uh, now, anyone who's curious about this piece, it has been, you can find it online, but it's also reprinted in a very new book uh, of previously uncollected essays called Art Isn't Fair that <coughs> I co-edited with Ina Steiner, who runs the Alan Sekula studio that we set up after Alan's death in 2013. Oh yeah, I should have said he was born in 1951 and he died in his early 60s in 2013. So, um, uh, there was, he left a lot of stuff, even more than me, he collected um, and didn't file so well. So there was an enormous amount of materials to go through and organize before finally we were ready to talk with the Getty Research Institute about their taking the archive, uh, which was a partial donation and a partial acquisition. Um, and just as we're getting ready to ship things off, I realized, oh, there are these 17 negatives of Vivian Meyer that no one's ever seen because all they are is negatives. But this was true really of most of Vivian Meyer's work that it was just in negative form, sometimes even in undeveloped film form. <coughs> but these have been processed. Uh, they were negatives, there were never any prints. And I thought before the material goes to the Getty, where it will become pretty hard to access. Why don't I think about making a portfolio? Because I had already set up an Alan Sekula uh, social documentary fund in his memory at CalArts to help fund with small grants for graduating both undergraduates and graduates working in documentary photography. Also because I thought it would be a good chance for these young artists to learn how to make an application even while they're in school for project funding. So, um, but how did he get these negatives? This is what I want to tell you about. Um, he, he actually in 2008, 2009 was working with the Renaissance Society, which is based at the University of Chicago in Chicago um, for an exhibition they invited him to do, which he decided would be called Polonia and Other Fables. <laughs> <coughs> Alan loved thinking in global terms. And uh, in this case, he since he is of Polish background, his grandfather had emigrated from Poland to Pennsylvania. Uh, he wanted to think about the connection between Chicago, a great metropolis, but having a huge population of uh, people of Polish heritage. Um, in fact, the largest uh, community of Poles outside of Warsaw um, and uh, Poland. So he was moving between Chicago and Poland. He also wanted to talk about unrest, resistance and dissatisfaction uh, and secrets in both places. Uh, so there were quite a number of demonstration pictures. He was always heartened by demonstrations, being himself a social activist as well as an artist and critic. Um, this is actually uh, uh, one of the photographs that's of a Puerto Rican day parade, but there were also Polish parades uh, in the exhibition as well. Uh, and there was also a catalog, which one could still find online, though I was kind of horrified to see how high the price was for what was once an inexpensive catalog. But that's what happens with stuff online. Um, 
at the time he was preparing Polonia and other fables, he had thought of inviting a local photographer or in fact of getting local artifacts about Chicago's history that he would, had started to find online. And it was in this process in 2009 that just coincidentally, John Maloof, who had recently bought a trunk at a um, storage auction of unpaid storage, uh, had bought this trunk that had all these negatives as well as film, also some cameras, etc. <coughs> and he, he, who really wasn't part of the world at the time of photography, um, thought, well, I'll just cut up some negatives and put them online and offer them for about between fifteen and twenty-five dollars each, um, and see if anyone's interested. And yep, Alan happened to be there. And yep, Alan was went, oh, these are amazing, and um, started uh, bidding on them and buying them for between 15 and $25 plus postage. Um, this is at a time when he was also finishing a film, The Forgotten Space, about the ocean and the maritime world. So he was often traveling. So these packages from Chicago started arriving and um, would pile up. And they were also combined with lots of packages from of things he was buying because he was also collecting and I had actually agreed he could do this indulgence uh, because he was collecting a lot um, to do something called the Dockers Museum of Maritime Artifacts. <coughs> but after another trip when he returned home um, I said what are these flat envelopes and he said oh these are these amazing negatives you have to look at them and he started showing them to me and I went, uh, this, these are about Chicago mainly. Um, I was, we were still just looking at them as negatives uh, and uh, they don't relate to the maritime space. Uh, this is beyond what uh, I thought you were doing. He said, well, everything is connected and anyway, I really wanted to think about possibly putting some of these for the exhibition. But I said, uh, and how many have you bought? And it turned out he had bought 17 and he came down and said, I just have a new email from John Maloof where he says, there are gonna be thousands more. And uh, I said, Alan, we can't afford thousands more at 20 to $25 each. Um, and he said, really not? And I said, no, really, this is reality. I said, and anyway, you should tell this person that uh, if these ne all the negatives are so interesting, he should keep them together. And thereafter, John Maloof always said, it was the great photographer, Alan Sakula, who told me I should curate this as a collection and not break it piecemeal as he started to do. Um, so uh, he did, ultimately in Polonia and other fables, Sakula did not include any other photographer, though he had done this once before um, in, in an exhibition in Liverpool uh, with a local photographer, um, but he, remained interested in uh, Vivian Meyer as the story was unfolding. Indeed, in 2010, <coughs> sorry, after um, his exhibition was over, he wrote to Suzanne Gaze and Hamza Walker, who is now out here actually, to say, I might even come for this exhibition that Maloof is doing because I'm kind of connected to it as you can see in various stories where I'm credited as encouraging uh, John Maloof to work on this as a collection. Meanwhile, John Maloof had left his job as a realtor uh, and had started both learning. I, I think he was probably paying other people to process the film, but he was also trying to learn both traditional analog processing and printing of black and white materials um, and becoming himself trying to become a photographer. I don't know how that's developed since then. Um, and uh, he, so even at the time, because he had encouraged Maloof, you need to do an exhibition and an exhibition was happening at the end of 2010. He said, I'm gonna try to make it out to Chicago. Unfortunately, this is when he started getting sick. And by early 2011, I said, you have to go see your doctor uh, because there's something wrong. And he said, what is it? And I said, I can't tell you what it is. I'm not a medical doctor. I just have a PhD. So um, I arranged for him to go to uh, UCLA. Uh, and that's when we got the news that he already had stage four cancer. So um, he never did go to see any of the Meyer exhibitions uh, after that. And they began to proliferate. There was also another collector in addition to John Maloof who had his, had actually acquired another trunk of materials. 
Okay. Uh, it, it's when I was actually working with Ina on the archive, that, and we were also checking with Alan's email, uh, this is after he is gone, uh, that Ina found an email and said, wait a second, there's an email from John Maloof from, I think it was uh, late 2009, where he still wasn't having much success um, selling. Uh, and he hadn't decided what to do. And he said, hey, Alan, I'm willing to sell this to you, the whole trunk for $3,000. And I remembered, oh yeah, there was this moment when Alan came downstairs and said, we could have the whole thing for $3,000. And I went, yes, uh, this is not happening. We already agreed. Uh, you can collect on maritime, but not on this. But listening to this around 2015 or 16, I went, oh my God, now that, Vivian Meyer had become a celebrity and there was a whole cottage industry around her. I said, for $3,000, we could have had the whole co collection. Um, but I also was looking around at all the Sakula materials and I said, it's really good that John Maloof stuck with it. And uh, because otherwise we would have it here and I wouldn't know what to do with it. I wouldn't be able to devote myself to it as Ina and I together were already devoting full time to organizing the Sakula archive. So that's when I turned to Stephen about the making of the archive. And in the process, we learned about we needed to have a colophon. It was Michael Dawson who actually told us more about it would be useful to have a little essay. And so I penned a little essay about the backstory. I'm not going to read to you the essay I find reading on Zoom uh, narcoleptic, putting all of us to sleep. Um, and I've given you pretty much the outline of the backstory. But the last page of this fold out four sided colophon. Uh, no, sorry, one second. Uh, was where we actually gave the specs and Steve took over and supplied the specs as, uh, the specs as well as showing little thumbnails of all 17 images. And really there were only 17, but these images have not been seen in any of the exhibitions and books because Alan scooped them for better or worse before uh, anyone else pretty much had gotten to them. I think just a few other people had been bidding online at the time. Um, so I'm gonna now turn this over to Stephen with whom I worked very closely and am totally indebted for um, both his intellectual and aesthetic input and also for all of his technical skills in making terrific prints from these um, somewhat funky negatives uh, that have been sitting in a trunk for who knows how long. Steve. <laughs> well, thank you, Sally. Um, when I, you know, I got first in, involved in this uh, project, when Sally was mentioning that she wanted to do this portfolio um, idea and to um, use it as a way to um, fund uh, the project fund at Cal Arts, and I. I told her I was very much interested in being a part of it, um, that I would help in any way. Um, and of course, not really knowing what I was getting into. Um, but that's always the great thing about that is you just go forward. And um, it's, it, um, you know, it was also kind of a, a way for me to, to be involved in this funky, weird story of Vivian Meyer, right? So some kind of small connection to this. Uh, bigger story for me. So I had come across her work as most of us had in the early 2013 or 14 um, and seen the film that John Malou first produced and I showed to my um, beginning photo classes all the time because I think it's it's very interesting to hear their reaction about this mysterious photographer and how she obsessively photographed and didn't show them to anyone and why she would do that. And so the students have a great time speculating about what, uh, what, what her motivations were and things like that. So um, I, I was thankful to, to be a part of it. So we, we were under the gun um, to get the negative scanned before they went off to the Getty. And so that was the first thing I was involved in and, and um, getting them scanned. Um, and uh, then it was really just a process of um, uh, making, um, adjusting the negatives and um, getting them ready for, for printing. And then we, there was some time um, where we 
had had to wait um, between then. That gave me uh, an adequate time to get the images adjusted and uh, in, in the computer and things like that. So, um, do you want to advance the slide again, Sally? Do you want to say anything about this this picture? Well, um, uh, yes, between this and the second picture, uh, it's clear, and we see this also in lots of the pictures that have appeared in the Vivian Meyer books, uh, her love of silhouettes, of this pretty stark black and white imagery of herself. Uh, she also photographed herself in mirrors, as we see in one of these uh, book cover pictures as well. But she loved playing almost classically modernist with the simple silhouettes. Um, and so this is one of the two uh, silhouette images we have from what Alan selected very early. Remember, he was only looking at a very little amount of materials that John was putting up at the time. Um, and we see it again, even, I mean, often photographers learn you're not supposed to have your shadow in the picture, but she clearly loved to have her shadow in the picture uh, or else she simply hadn't learned it because she was self-taught, um, but this was her preference. And she also, we know from other pictures, was always wearing hats. She was, uh, some would say she had a kind of mannish style and um, often wore a fedora. Um, and uh, it sort of gave her more authority and presence as she left um, suburban Chica posh uh, Chicago. This is probably Winnetka uh, on the North Shore, which is where most of her work was uh, with wealthy families uh, that wanted a nanny. And, um, but then she would go downtown, so. So one of, one of the things I was struck by immediately was the quality of the negatives. And even though they were maybe sort of stored in a sort of funky, um, well, just a box, um, you know, was just the, the quality of the negatives in terms of how that the camera that she used, um, uh, that it produced these really beautiful negatives. Um, I was a little bit familiar with this kind of camera, this Rolly twin lens reflex that, that, that she used because um, a friend of my mom's had given me, I think while I was still in high school, a, a, a Rolly and, um, and I used it quite a bit and um, become kind of familiar with the kind of negatives that it produced that this very smooth kind of um, mid-tones and beautiful tonality. So um, we went to adjusting these, uh, the, these negatives and um, what, you know, the thing about, you know, we don't really know what Vivian Meyer's preferences were. We don't know how she would have uh, presented her work, whether she would have cropped the photos at all or done anything or, or how she would have, um, uh, made them look. And so I kind of wanted to just take a very light hand in terms of like my interpretation of the negatives and printed them all just full frame um, and kind of what you call a kind of a straight print with not very much burning and dodging or any kind of editorializing on my part. I wasn't trying to enhance certain aspects of the photograph or, or draw attention here or there, um, but just kind of give a good rendition of of the photograph. And I love this one because uh, of course, um, Alan being a collector of all things maritime. So this is was an obvious one for him, I think. It was an obvious draw for him. And maybe he thought, <clears throat> maybe I can palm this off as it's all maritime with this picture, even though the rest are not at all maritime. <laughs> But she spent a lot of time on her off hours, her free time downtown, um, in a kind of seedy part of downtown Chicago. She was um, fascinated by the transients there, um, but giving them a kind of dignity of looking directly back at her as well. Um, <clears throat> they were sort of checking her out uh, as she was also studying them. It's hard to know. We don't know. have any annotation in terms of <coughs> are these guys potential day laborers? Are they just sunning themselves uh, on a fairly rare sunny day in Chicago in winter, uh, living in an SRO, single room occupancy hotel, a bachelor hotel? We'll see another picture in a second. 
of such a hotel. And she also sometimes would get what seemed a mix of different types meeting in downtown Chicago. And that's pretty rare in the history of photography. My favorite such a picture is by Lewis Hine of a boy news seller with a lady dressed up in all her finery. <coughs> it's hard to tell here if the man in front uh, with uh, what might be a Panama, hard to say, um, is actually well healed, uh, but looking just a little uh, wild uh, and grumpy, or if he's actually one of the downtown types, the transients as well. But the people behind are part of the new up and coming white collar set of Chicago, uh, even in old town part of Chicago. Here we see one of the bachelor hotels <coughs> very related to where the guys had been sitting up on, I don't know if you can see um, uh, uh, the Goodwill Industries before uh, there, uh, just hanging out, uh, waiting for work or just it's where they were hanging out, it's not clear. Another kind of hanging out, but this time it seems possibly uh, more of suburban sightseers or uh, out of town tourists. Uh, uh, checking out even the quite colorful um, inner city Chicago, this being a street which mainly seems to have bars. Um, with one guy yeah. um, sort of performing for her. Yeah, and hey, clearly, clearly wants to be famous. So sees a person with a camera. Here I am. <laughs> Waiting to be discovered, maybe for Second City. Second City being, of course, one of Chicago's uh, famous theatrical features. <coughs> and here we get a mix of the old style, late 19th century uh, architecture that had been photographed by Louis Sullivan. Uh, I mean, that had been built and designed by Louis Sullivan that actually Sarkowski uh, photographed with his book, The Idea of Louis Sullivan and the new 50s and 60s skyscrapers that were coming up to characterize a new skyline in Chicago with a white collar trench coat guy on a, a, some kind of motorcycle or a motor scooter. Unclear if these two women are going to the museum possibly or to theater or if they happen to be uh, sort of executive secretaries at lunch, but probably going to either a museum or theater. Um, looking quite prim in a new, more refined, manicured part of the Chicago Lakeshore. There are three. Uh, I'm not sure Alan needed to get all three, but he did because he loved this idea of a popular outdoor art exhibit because he also really liked the idea of popular art from the ground up and here it's literally offered on the ground. I've never caught into clowns and paintings of clowns really don't do it for me, even when they're done by <laughs> Max Beckman, um, sorry. And here we get, uh, we realize the source is probably the something garage art gallery with- um, These three shots, very, very obviously came from the same roll of film um, yes. about at the same time. And they may even have been in sequence, but we don't know the sequence, they were cut. Yeah. More of tourists downtown uh, in Chicago. Of course, she photographed also when she went on trips abroad, but this is not what John Maloof was offering in these first couple of weeks in 2009. Uh, this is one of my personal favorites. Uh, I love this guy sort of screwing his neck, his head back, his face. What you doing? Why are you photographing me? And I also love his um, proto uh, ripped jeans, uh, ripped t-shirt, uh, sort of falling apart t-shirt. I don't think this was probably one of her charges, uh, but a kid she just found and saw and was delighted with his energy, his fierce energy on the street. Um, 
The Russians have a word for this. It's called buit. It's the very low, the very common, the, that which you almost want to sweep under the rug. Uh, Vivian Meyer really liked looking at um, the very low, the buit, in other words. Uh, and um, so this is a photograph of not just all the junk and dust on the street, but even a discarded broom that has broken off after overuse as a broom, a broom head, a broom brush. And the final image, uh, the other silhouette, um, I imagine that she made this in her small governess nanny bedroom um, with a shadow, a sunlight window on the wall. But here, it, it really looks like someone saying, get me out of here. And it's clear that she used every opportunity to get out of um, prim, proper, upper middle class to upper class homes, sometimes taking the kids with her to get more excitement and interest downtown and in the world, in the wider world. Uh, so um, here's how the entire portfolio looked uh, probably a year after we had finished, uh, a year and a half maybe, um, uh, when it was on view one evening at Red Cat, CalArts downtown uh, space uh, on its fabulous long red wall, when we had both pages of the colophon in frames and all 17 images. Um, most collectors, uh, certainly I don't have such a huge expanse of one long wall in which to put all these up. Um, but I loved seeing it there. And this was the way to announce and to try to encourage people to consider collecting from this edition of 17. Because Steve, we haven't yet said, we decided it all had to be archival, uh, both inks and paper. And uh, it, um, it was going to be a limited edition. And uh, I chose the weird number 17 only because there were 17 images and I liked that 17 by 17 plus a few artist proofs, uh, and Steve and I are happy recipients of those. Um, and uh, that even though we've shown them on a horizontal PowerPoint screen, um, they're all vertical. Um, Steve, you just checked and yes, there, <laughs> thank one. you. Thank you. So they're, um, they're, 11, they're on 11 by 14 paper. Um, they're eight and a half inches square. The image is eight and a half square. Um, other specs, uh, Sally and I met at Freestyle one afternoon and, and went through their vast uh, paper display to find a paper that we thought was suitable. And I had used this um, Canson um, platine fiber rag paper before, but it seemed to be a really obvious choice. It has the look and feel of a silver gelatin paper, but it's 100% it's, uh, cotton, it's acid free, there's no brighteners that could fade over time. And I think it just gave the pictures a real classic look to it. So we, we did go with that. And, um, and then uh, after that, it was a matter of um, procuring uh, sufficient batches so that we could maintain consistency throughout the portfolios. Um, we went through an extensive testing procedure and I made many test prints and sh we showed them to each other and talked about them and, um, you know, finally um, got, got it dialed in. And so I think it's, it's one of those things about digital photography that we sort of assume that it's just, you just adjust it on the computer screen and make a print, but of course, you, if you want to make exhibition worthy prints, you really need to test, test and test. So that's- And these are really exhibition worthy. I mean, uh, Steve and I also made a couple of visits to gallery shows of her work uh, w when they were up in Los Angeles. And um, of course I'm prejudiced, um, but uh, I have to say, I think Steve's are the best prints. None of the prints that have been on view are Vivian Meyer prints because she, um, she made very few prints herself, uh, and then there's some. She also had some drugstore prints made, but um, everything since has been professional prints. But Steve's, in my opinion, are the most impeccably professional and quite rich and elegant as prints. Thank, Thank you. you, Steve. Thank you. Um, with my own sets, um, I've actually played with different combos because I don't have a red big red wall which runs like 
you know, 25 feet. Um, so with just using a couple of frames and a past part two, um, I've been able to plunk them into two uh, identical frames. Uh, actually, I have three. And um, in this case, I wanted to counterpose uh, the sort of young white collar exec type uh, against the two women. <coughs> These two downtown shots that mix um, the prosperous with the kind of either CD types or CD locale. The three from the <coughs> outdoor exhibition. Uh, just these two are my faves in terms of this young boy and her sort of uh, reflecting uh, on both her profile and her hand up. But I've also enjoyed this combination uh, of her uh, shadow here and her silhouette uh, portrait of her hand wanting out uh, on the left. The two silhouettes with uh, the broom in the gutter. The, the two end pieces being sort of kind of classic and pure and this very dirty and gritty uh, in the center. And finally, just the two silhouettes. But those are just my favorites in play. <coughs> um, from the I had already set up by 2014 a small fund to support the idea of students who were completing documentary projects broadly defined. Um, for the art school uh, and film faculty to decide on applicants who would get small grants, usually between a thousand and twenty five hundred. And I I'm quite vague here because I ultimately said it's up to you to decide. I'm uh, only initiating and helping to fund this, but um, I'm not overseeing it in any way. Oops. Um, and uh, so these are some of the 31 uh, students who were awarded grants for projects in both film and photography. For a short presentation, I'm not showing film clips also because I'm such a newbie with all this Zoom stuff. I did, I felt this would be a disaster, though some of the films are really quite impressive. So I'm going to show you little glimpses of four recipients, starting with Joel Or Orozco, who was born in Chihuahua, um, who began working on a farm in his teens and thus encountered a member of the Tarahumara Native American people who invited him to his village. And he became fascinated both with that village and a neighboring village, both of which were off the track. And so when he was at CalArts, he kept returning to want to photograph there. This gives you a sense of some of the work, uh, which uh, actually it reminds me very much of the sort of genre, the path of Ralph Eugene Meat Yard in terms of this play with fantasy, with ordinary local types, um, the use of masks as well. I don't know uh, if this is the same person wearing the mask and unmasked uh, here. I think we'll see the, the masked person again in a minute, uh, but I find these very powerful and um, look forward to the time when he both does a major show and a book of his work. Um, I love this picture of using what looks like Barbies to do a kind of Lucha Libra in, uh, with chickens as the audience um, in a really hard scrabble backyard uh, with trough. These are actually villages that don't have any running water or electricity other than minimal solar power. And finally, these two pictures, and uh, and I, they had their own rituals and theater. I don't know how much he was staging what to me looks like an image of the Grim Reaper coming for an aged member of the village. Um, and I do, can't tell you anything about this figure uh, over here, except it looks like the masked figure uh, that we saw before. Um, but it it is promising work that I think, um, leads us to await a major project that we will see and be able also to study in book form. Boz Garden uh, grew up in an inland uh, Northern California suburban town surrounded by farmland where he says everyone knew the name of the quarterback. The way I learned to orient myself to the world that seemed so far from me was through cinema. The subjection of the black queer body by society figures prominently in his work 
a quote, for me, art making is about bringing into being the non-being by refracting ideas and images of, Af of American identity through an Afro-Latinx non-binary lens. Oh, I want to say one thing that I uh, stepped over, unfortunately. And Orozco ends, I'm a, I don't know if I can go back. Can I go back uh, to Orozco's statement? He goes, I want an image that speaks for itself. That's what's important. And in this selection, we're gonna see people who are working mainly on silent images like Orozco. Uh, and then we will see others. Uh, and I think this really is the two paths of documentary who are really working with text as well. Now, in the case of Boz Garden's book that was given to me a couple of years ago, uh, when, it, at the end of a meeting where I met some of the new awardees, I took it home and then realized the type is so small, <coughs> I can't read it. And I kind of freaked out like, is this some newfangled CalArts design style, uh, which is both presents text and makes it absolutely inaccessible and sort of was very frustrated, even irritated by it. Um, because I had a sense that he is dealing with Hollywood and Hollywood locations around Southern California. And I wanted to know more about his thinking. And yet it was really such a micro type that I couldn't read. Um, so I borrowed from statements from Cal Arts. Uh, he went to various sites, including North Hollywood Park filmed in John Hughes's Say Anything, 1989, though this is considered a kind of somewhat crime ridden park that's been sanitized in the John Hughes movie. Um, also to Monrovia High School, which was the location for Cinderella Story. Uh, and uh, finally, I wanted to show this image uh, from the football field only because I uh, was so impressed with how it links to him saying he grew up in a town where the only celebrities, they weren't Hollywood stars, but they were the quarterbacks, the football players at the local high school. And it must have been actually hard for him as a young, a uh, man of color in this context, even if he looked football or sport worthy to have other interests like art and cinema and photography. Uh, but here he photographs at Monrovia, the Monrovia, the football field. Uh, and by the way, uh, I finally got in touch with Boz Garden and said, why was this book so unreadable? Because I actually think these statements that CalArts gave me are so interesting. And, um, and yet you have not um, made it readable for, and he said, oh, this was an error. And I'm in the process of reprinting this book. Um, it, it was a glitch in communication with getting the book jobbed out. So I'm really looking forward to this being a new expose of um, the way uh, this, his interests are about Hollywood locales and the actuality of those locales and those locale histories. Uh, and his larger emerging interest in issues of race, justice, and injustice, and land use, uh, and private property in Southern California and beyond, in, in a land where we are all on uh, what could be sacred land of prior people who inhabited this place. Ali Ali actually uh, got a uh, grant for making a film, but I'm instead going to in show you only some of the stills, which I think are really amazing. She is actually the daughter of both a Yugoslav mother and a Yemeni father, both of whom were linguists. And <coughs> <coughs> that's clear um, because she has a great deal of interest in uh, language and is an extraordinary writer. Um, she went to Wellesley, then worked uh, uh, in Marrakesh, uh, where she was the director of operations for the Marrakesh Biennale and project coordinator for three editions of TEDx Marrakesh, and then decided to come to Cal Arts. According to Ali, as a female artist who exists on the borders of Arab, European, American, culturally Muslim, spiritually independent, my work explores cultural binaries and challenges culturally sanctioned oppression. Working primarily with photography, I address histories of colonization, imperialism, sexism, and racism in projects that take patterns and textiles as their primary motif. 
For her Sekula Fund project, Ali produced two videos, but I'm just showing you. One is called Majar and the other is Conflict is More Profitable Than Peace. The latter, she writes in a statement, translates a photograph binder into time-based media do documenting the ongoing war in Yemen. It attempts to unravel the intricate web of facts and players that have, of which the US is a major player, but really using Saudi Arabia as a proxy. Uh, that have generated the complicated state of affairs from which one of the worst humanitarian crises of our time has emerged, but gotten relatively little play here. Um, speaking about fabric, this is from her Flux piece, and I'm just going to read uh, from these fabrics in Flux are commodity. You can find this on her website. Uh, once considered as precious and as commonplace as gold, frankincense. Uh, myrrh, jewelry, and as previously mentioned, humans. Flux questions the very nature of how things get named, how they are translated, and how eventually are reinterpreted. Furthermore, it questions the intention of their production. If it is not for the preservation of heritage, then is it for the propagation of economic wealth? And for that matter, whose wealth? Here she's using West African fabrics I first noticed this work because I've long loved West African fabrics, but I'd never seen a figure self-camouflaging using these fabrics. And I'm just going to end showing you this other piece of the, from the Love series. You can find this online in which she's made these photographs, again, kind of veiled, masked self-portraits, but written love on each... Um, <coughs> while writing a complimentary text, she points out the sort of deliberate mistranslations of Arabic into standard English. For example, madrasa, which really just means school, is now translated often as Islamic terrorist training camp. Uh, and trying to break from these Western funneled, confined ideas about the Arab and Islamic world. Finally, back to home turf, uh, Andrew Seidenberg, though not from Southern California, actually from Staten Island, New York, where he went to college in New York City at Hunter, um, but came out here to do his graduate work and ended up uh, finding inexpensive digs in the valley and then decided to make the valley the subject of his work, both in film and in documentary photography for a book. And I'm just going to quickly show you because we're running out of time. Uh, some of the very banal images, which I know Alan would be especially interested in, in terms of let's look at the underside again, um, uh, the underside of the valley that we normally try to ignore in favor of all those Hollywood images, uh, such as here, uh, close to where he lived. And besides taking his own photographs for the project, Seidenberg has drawn from an archive of 52,000 photographs of the San Fernando Valley that are part of LA's Tessa Digital Collections. And he also speaks about how, even though he did not work with Alan, uh, who had died quite a few years before, uh, coming to Cal Arts prompted him to start reading Alan's work uh, and um, uh, really thinking about Alan's theories, critical theorization of archives. Okay, with me racing uh, like a tired racehorse, uh, we've come to the end of the formal presentation, but we do have 10, 15 minutes for questions, both about the portfolio, the backstory, um, the contents of the portfolio, and the fact that even though some of the sets have sold at auction for, I think as high as 8,000 or at least $7,000 at Paddle 8, there are a few remaining that CalArts has on offer for $5,000 uh, and all of the proceeds go to funding future awards of student projects working in documentary at CalArts. And we're leaving this frame up just so that uh, anyone who's interested can then um, contact Michael Rogers at CalArts. And Bailey has returned to uh, organize the last Q&A portion Thank you for your presentation, Sally and Stephen. It was really enjoyable for me to watch, especially Sally, since my own image seeing and process was heavily informed by you and Alan's work, right? So that was, that was wonderful. Thank you. 
Um, I do want to sure. jump to some comments and questions right away. Um, sure. Douglas Bush actually made a comment about, I mean, David Mizell, sorry, um, made a comment about uh, Ali Ali's recent podcast that he watched with uh, Heidi Zuckerman earlier today. So that's a shout out and something to maybe look into. Thank you. I didn't know about her podcast. Thank Neither. you. I'm going to look this up. <laughs> you know, being old, Jen, uh, I don't instantly uh, flood with podcasts. I go, a oh, podcast, this sounds like too 21st century, whatever. But I started listening to them. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, uh, David, for that. Uh, so the first, um, the first two questions that we received were from Michael Dawson. Uh, it's in two parts. I mean, a few of his points were answered, but I'd like to just hold space for them to be engaged a little further. Um, he said, I'm just going to read verbatim. He said, I'm curious to know how Sally and Al Alan init uh, initially reacted to the Meyer photographs. Uh, was there something in the collection that really connected with them, given their vast knowledge of photography and photographic history? That was the first half of the question. I think that <laughs> Alan in particular thought, who is this woman? She's an amazing street photographer. Alan loved street photography, as do I as well. Um, and we were just looking at the negatives and I had only seen 17 at the time. And I, I also, I was trying to discourage my husband from going whole hog in this other direction after he told me there are gonna be thousands more. I went, ho oh, hum, there are lots of street photographers. Um, I have remained more, I have become more and more impressed with Vivian Meyer. And, but also wondering, are there hundreds, thousands of Vivian Meyers we don't know about um, because they weren't discovered by avid collectors, promoters at, you know, uh, storage auctions. Um, but I think she's very interesting, very impressive. Uh, and um, and I actually, I think if I hadn't um, held Alan back, he would have actually acquired even more and they, we would see even more of this work. Uh, but I went, hey, hello, uh, this is too much, um, especially hearing there were gonna be thousands more and at $25 a pop, um, uh, that was impo financially impossible for us. Um, there was then this offer, well, for $3,000, I'll sell you the whole trunk. Um, and, and then I think, oh my God, but I'm uh, right. overseeing the Sekula legacy has been challenge enough. Um, so I'm really glad that Alan convinced John Maloof to take this on himself. Yeah, I think, you could, I mean, any, anyone's familiar with the hundreds of thousands of negatives that, that she produced, um, it really is a full-time uh, occupation putting together her archive. Right. Um, and then there's actually the second half of Michael Dawson's question, which is, um, I'm also curious to know how Stephen interpreted Meyer's negatives in the print process. Uh, did you rely on printed Meyer photographs or his own interpretation? Which you answered a little bit, but, you know. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, it had to be my interpretation as there was no other, you know, we, we had seen other people print her work. Um, you know, the work that was printed for Maloof's film, um, you know, th those those kind of things like that. Um, uh, so we didn't, it had to be, um, you know, what I thought of the negatives. And like I said, I, I wanted to take a kind of a light hand not editorialized too much, but I, I drew upon, I, I actually worked as a commercial printer for a couple of years. And so I printed a lot of other people's negatives and um, uh, um, some good and some most very bad, <laughs> I have to say, but uh, um, you know, that was just part of the, the, the job. And so um, I think, you know, I became very comfortable at sort of taking someone's work and sort of presenting it as best as I, as I felt it could be. And so the negatives were, were wonderful to work with. I think, you know, I mean, that, uh, you know, they're, they're definitely a glimpse into this world that she was photographing in and a glimpse into her, how she was working and, and, um, and the kind of camera that she used to produce this kind of tonality. And I just went from there. Uh, we as, as everyone did, because there are no Vivian Meyer prints to speak of. Right. Uh, so everyone was interpreting, but I think actually Steve did a brilliant job. Thank you. Yeah. 
Uh, we have another question from Rob Aft, which is simply, did Alan collect, actively collect negatives or just these? Alan actively collected all manner of things. So indeed, the archive also had quite a few other negatives. Um, uh, for better or worse, he lived with uh, someone, myself, um, who would sometimes go, uh, what are you doing here? Because uh, he really collected an enormous amount of stuff. There, at the time of his last months, and uh, there were rooms that were almost hard to enter. I mean, uh, physically hard, to, impenetrable, um, because there was so much stuff. Um, so yes, there were other negatives. Um, this was the most coherent, if small set of negatives that he bought, but he would also at garage sales and other places go, look at this, isn't this interesting? Um, and I sort of had, uh, I sound horrible about myself, well, whatever. I would so go ho-hum, okay, yeah, I, I'm sure you can find this at yard sales. Um, but why did you have to bring it home? What are we gonna do with it? And a lot of stuff he didn't do anything with, but he, he really wanted to have a very eclectic collection around him and it inspired him in lots of different ways. Yeah. Um, okay, if, there's, if there are any other questions, now's a good time to go ahead and throw those in the q and A. I I wanna just circle back to a few comments here that are in the chat, just, um, from some attendees. So Joseph Ackerman said, what an amazing story. Thank you all for sharing it with us. Uh, Claire Cunning was commenting on the broom image. The uh, broom looks like a figure dying in the gutter. <laughs> um, yeah, and actually on that point, uh, Sally, what was that term again? I think you said uh, uh, breet. I, I believe the standard uh, English spelling is B-U-I-T. But of course, it's Russian. It's from the Cyrillic alphabet, um, and I don't speak Russian. But I've <laughs> heard a, a Russian art historian, uh, Christina Kerr, talk about Buit, and I thought, oh, this also relates to a kind of funky documentary interest. Uh, uh, so, uh, but so I think it is spelled in English B U I T. Yeah. I just, I just like that you threw that. What, what, Stephen? I was going to add. I was just going to add something about Alan's collecting, and I just think you know Alan was someone who had an insatiable curiosity, and 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 as a photographer, I think this sort of idea about you know photographing is a way of collecting, also you know you collect the world in a way, and and so I'm not at all surprised. Well, I was kind of surprised at the extent of his collecting. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. I'm not really surprised. And, and certainly there are many other artists who are also collectors. I remember toward the end of his life, Bob Heineken uh, said something to me and I said, are you also a collector? And he said, oh my God, I have so much things. Uh, and um, he said, I have a whole warehouse. And Alan would sometimes say, you really don't know about artists and collections because most artists, our house had become something of a warehouse. But he said, most artists have separate warehouses for this. Um, I understand that uh, I have this on, hearsay that Frank Gehry uh, doesn't throw anything out, that his collections take up enormous warehouses. Um, I mean, both, of course, his important architectural drawings, but there is other stuff as well. Um, so artists really can be uh, encyclopedists of their own interests. Yeah, absolutely. We have a new question here from Alejandro Sanchez. Um, why digital prints over analog prints? And thank you for the talk. So I think that's one for you, Stephen. Yes, I think so. Um, you know, uh, the, we were under a time crunch for one thing, um, that the negatives actually had to go to, to the Getty. So uh, there wasn't, there wouldn't been time to make analog prints um, in the dark room. Um, but I certainly, certainly am experienced in doing that. Um, but even the prints that are others th that uh, are being made um, of Vivian Meyer's work, we noticed that um, they were they were also scanned and then maybe printed, um, finished on silver gelatin paper um, through a, um, a hybrid process, or which is called something which I can't remember, um, but that uses uh, 
uh, a final print being silver gelatin, but generated from a computer. Um, so I think that's, and uh, I believe that's how Maloof is um, getting those prints out as well. And so yeah. um, that was, I think the primary reason. And also to keep the portfolio in a cost um, that, that would be affordable, I think. Because it actually is, uh, I mean, the, the other prints we saw were selling from like two or $3,000 to seven and eight and maybe even $10,000 in editions of 10 and uh, they were somewhat larger. They were, I think 16 by 20s, which I thought was kind of um, yeah. anachronistically gross um, <laughs> since that's not at all the world that Vivian Meyer worked in, lived in, photographed in. Um, in fact, I initially said, why don't we do this on eight by 10 paper? And Steve said, come on, we're not going to all this trouble to do these miniature little prints as well. So we compromised and I'm glad for Steve's pushing back on this on 11 by 14. Um, uh, the other thing is uh, maybe we could have done it with photographic paper if I had thought about this earlier, but I'm someone who, well, first of all, I was juggling so much thinking about getting this ready for the Getty. Uh, and in fact, I had to have open heart surgery as a, again also. So I was trying to like um, coordinate, orchestrate this, that it would go to the Getty before I, a week before I was having surgery, but it was just two months before I went, wait a second, we need to like scan these and consider this as a new source for raising money for the Sekula Social Documentary Fund. Had I thought about it a year before when I was juggling 12 other things, 20 other things, uh, maybe there would have been time to do it. But I think we did a great job and Steve's prints are really magnificent. Yeah, absolutely. We have a, um, just it's a great It's a great question though. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Alejandro, that was a great question. Um, we have a comment from Margie Ornston saying she just wanted to acknowledge Alan and Sally for sharing these amazing images with the world. Thank um, you. And then we have one more question here from Stephen Roberts. Uh, does the Art Institute of Chicago own any of Vivian Meyer's photographs? Um, Hard to I say. can't say. Uh, uh, they don't have one of these portfolios. Um, and I don't know uh, if the Art Institute does. Uh, some institution, I think the public library may, and maybe Columbia College, I'm not certain. Now I know that Maloof has ultimately transferred much of the material to archives, I believe at the University of Chicago, you can find this out online to make sure that I'm correct and not incorrect in this. Um, but uh, I have thought about approaching the Art Institute to see if they're interested. In fact, an, a former local curator Ann Goldstein is now at the Art Institute uh, as associate director. I'm not 100% sure. Um, I so, so I have thought it would, yeah, I have thought about uh, talking to her about this. I may have already talked to her about it before and there were other things she wanted to talk about in terms of Sekula materials. Right. <laughs> um, okay, and actually just to follow back here since you were interested in this, Sally, as we close up, um, David Maisel actually said the podcast for Alia um, is called Conversations About Art, uh, hosted by Hi User Thank you. So I just want to know, yeah. Hosted um, by who? Heidi Zuckerman. Okay. I'm, I'm, now I know what to do Friday night. Um, since I'm not going dining and dancing, I'm going to check out this podcast. Thank you very much. I really was super impressed with Ali Ali's work. Uh, and I have great hopes to see more from her and in fact, from many of the awardees, including many of the film awardees as well. Um, yeah. I, I've been told that actually the existence of the fund, the process of encouraging graduating students at the beginning of their final year to develop a proposal, because of course, when they go out in the world, they're gonna be having to develop proposals all the time for funding, um, has been a, a real push to sort of get people to think about getting to the next level and doing uh, important public work, not just student work anymore. Although of course, student work is important. No, absolutely. Um, and not to just jump to the next point here, but we did get another question and we're closing in. So I just want to get this in really quickly. Um, yes. I'm not sure if I'm understanding it fully. So I'll just kind of paraphrase 
Um, now the negatives are at GRI. Uh, does that imply that the addition 17 plus AP is closed? No future printing in any size? No. <laughs> no, 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 no. So, um, and <clears throat> this is the only way to um, have these images it, because uh, Alan acquired them before there was all this Vivian Meyer hoopla. I mean, as indicated by the fact that John Maloof at some point wrote and said, I don't know if this is working. Uh, you wanna buy the whole trunk for three grand. Um, so, um, so it's before the Vivian Meyer industry took off. And um, so it is really in an addition of 17 uh, sets uh, with, uh, I think it is four or five, Steve can remember. Um, artist proof, Steve, what? me, Ina Steiner at the Sekula studio. Um, the Getty got one, though afterwards I heard they would have bought one, so, um, which would have been nice for the CalArts Fund. Um, sure. And uh, the Chicago lawyers, those wonderful Chicago lawyers, um, hashing out the Vivian Meyer estate interests also got one. Right. Okay. Maybe I should get the Chicago lawyers to donate their set to the Art Institute, but who I never know about lawyers. Whatever. <laughs> But your forward thinking, Sally, gets us all here. So, um, well, thanks to in now. Bailey. Again, and Mike. What'd you say? Just thank you, Bailey. Thanks also to Mike Rogers and to CalArts, and especially thanks to Steve Callis and his partner, uh, Judith Hopkins, to whom I always turn for advice, opinions, verdicts, <laughs> and who was integral to this project as well. Yeah, she, she came to many of our early meetings and was very helpful. Yes, we dragged her there or else we alerted her. I said, we're going to a great Moroccan Jewish restaurant halfway between us. Why don't you meet us there? Um, yeah. I hope this restaurant is still open at the end of the pandemic. This is unrelated to anything, but you all should try Ms. Lala. Um, there's one in Culver City and one in Sherman Oaks, if it's still going to open after the pandemic. Yes, can't wait. Okay. Uh, with that food tidbit, uh, adios. Yes. Thanks. Thank you everyone for being here. Um, thank Thanks. you, Sally and Stephen, for being here with us. Um, and yeah, we can close out here. Thank you for thank the you invite. so much. Thank really you everyone for being here. Happy Friday. Happy Friday. Happy weekend. Happy us getting through this whole time safely right. and supportively of each other. <laughs>